In our last discussion on segmentation, we talked about how it was critical to start with understanding the needs that or problems that buyers were trying to solve. And if we go back to the example of our, the automobile market, we saw that you know we could break it down by those seeking low-cost basic transportation or a luxurious driving experience or even a performance-oriented machine. But it's not just, I mean, you would think on surface that if we look at these, it's going to be, it's money. You know, it's how much income somebody has, but that's not always the case. For example, if you look at one of the world's richest men when he was alive, Sam Walton, who founded Walmart, uh, he always drove around a red pickup truck even after he's worth billions of dollars. And he's quoted as saying once that, what am I supposed to do, haul around my dogs in a Rolls Royce? This goes to more than just money. And that's where we have to start understanding why people are different and what they're trying to buy. So the next step in the process is to identify members of the segment to discover what unique aspects they share, as well as what sets them apart from others. Doing this requires us to look at the basis of segmentation. Now, outside of needs, we can segment the market based on several different factors. It could be geography, demographics, psychographics, behaviors. All of these different aspects are going to play a role in how customers are looking at problems and also how they're going to be grouped as buyers. So we look at, for example, geographic segmentation. Again, you can look at differences based on many different aspects. Um, for example, you would, could imagine that here in Idaho, we'll sell more snow machines, uh, snowmobiles, snow blowers, things like this, than they will in Florida. But in Florida and in the South, we're gonna probably sell more fishing and hunting supplies than we would in Los Angeles or Chicago. So there are differences out there. And the same thing, for example, a pickup truck is going to sell better in a rural area than it is in an urban area. So besides these type of geographic differences, there are also differences in this within the same metropolitan statistical area, such as Boise or Chicago. One of the things that has been uh, established over the last couple of decades is a system called PRISM by Claritus. And it's basically a geo-clustering approach that combines geographic data with demographic data that yields richer descriptions of consumers and neighborhoods. So they look at different things such as education and affluence, family life cycle, urbanization, race and ethnicity, and mobility. Inhabitants in a cluster tend to lead similar lives, drive similar cars, have similar jobs, and also read similar magazines. For example, when I finished my PhD in 2000 three, um, we moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan. It was my wife and I, and we had a two-year-old daughter. We moved, now I'm much older than most other people that have two-year-old daughters uh, at the time, and we moved into a neighborhood that was full of young couples in their early 30s that had kids in a similar age. We all made about the same level of income, had little different education because I had a PhD, but again, they were, you know, more highly educated than other parts of the of Kalamazoo. We had similar lifestyles because of the kids. So it was more about, you know, clustering together. I guess it's the birds of a feather philosophy, if you will. In addition to geographics, demographic segmentation is also going to be a very important and easy way to collect information about a segment. Demographic variables are very often associated with consumer needs and wants, and they're pretty easy to measure. One of the things to look at, again, we talked about demographics when we were looking at, at consumer behavior last time, but if we think about, for example, family life cycle, and we go back to our example on uh, laundry detergents. Well, think about, you know, when you have small children, you need drift, then you're probably going to move into something like Tide, then as kids get dirtier, era. And then as they get older, gain and then cheer and um, so forth, so on. It just kind of goes into this type of cycle. By understanding the number of people and where they are in their family life cycle, we can understand the type of product that they're going to be looking for. One other factor to look at is, for example, is gender. You know, it's, it was amazing that when I, I learned this, that women influence about 80% of all consumer purchases. They make about 75% of all new home decisions and purchase 60% of cars, which in, the, in a little while is gonna come back to show some things might not be right with some of our car manufacturers. Okay, let's go, let's go. Okay, go, 
Oftentimes, markets start out as very being very broad. For example, if we look back in, in history and look when, for example, Coca-Cola was begun, their entire market segment was everybody. Everybody was having a Coke. That was about the only thing that was available. It was a new thing into the marketplace. But after time, people's taste and preferences began to change. Came along Tab, and then Diet Coke, and then Sprite, and Mr. Pibb, all of these different things, because people's taste started to change. Well, we see that even more today as people are looking for very different things and not only soft drinks, but uh, other beverages to drink. For example, Coca-Cola is one of the largest sellers of water. And even in the diet segment, most of the things, diet products were being sold toward women. And although men were looking for something similar, they weren't pleased with the aspect of a diet product. So we came up with Coke Zero, Dr. Pepper 10, all of these different products that appeal might primarily to the male portion of the market. Each generation or, or cohort is profoundly influenced by the times in which they grow up, the music, movies, politics, and defining events of that period. Members also share the same major cultural, political, and economic experiences and have similar outlooks and values. Marketers often ad advertise to a cohort by using the icons and images that are prominent in its experiences. They also try to develop products and services that uniquely meet the particular interest or needs of a generational target. I mean, one of the things to look at, if you look at the spending power, I mean, the millennials, which many of you may be part of, uh, they have about $187 billion in annual spending power. This is a lot of money. However, it, it pales in comparison to what the baby boom generation is uh, reported to have access to. For example, here are some of the different cohorts that are out there now, the millennials, Gen X, baby boomers, silent generations. Um, again, if you'll see, the baby boomers control three-fourths of all the wealth in the U.S. And we're basically seeking the fountain of youth, or in my case, the fountain of middle age. You know, hair color, hair replacement, that's, I guess, me, and home exercise equipment are very heavy sellers for this group of individuals. If we'll continue with our auto insurance segmentation example, let's look at the retention rates by different generational cohorts. And if you look, the pre-boomers and the boomers, they very much are loyal to their existing insurance agents and companies, primarily because they don't like to change. They don't, you know, change is not really the best thing at this age because you know, I guess we get comfortable in our age. However, it's not always the case. I'm a member of a financial group, I guess you could say, called USAA. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's geared toward uh, people that were in the military or who had parents in the military, as in my case. And I've been with this company for probably 30 years, and I've always had my insurance with them. Well, recently, I, on a whim, I decided to check what my insurance would be with another company, GEICO. And it ended up I saved about $480 over a year. So did I switch? You better believe it. But, you know, I guess I'm part of that 8%. But everybody else, I mean, again, the Gen Ys, they're, you know, most of the time they're going to start out with the insurance that their, their parents had, which is, a, I guess, a way to build in that some level of loyalty. But over time, they start to see that, hey, maybe there's something out there that's settled and focused just on me, and they make the switch. I'm your son. And as you well know, I can barely focus on one thing at a time. So between mowing the lawn and football, I choose football. Sorry, Robert. Five dollars doesn't buy my undivided attention. And if you've got cut rate insurance, you might end up with a financial buzz cut. So get all state. You can save money and be better protected from mayhem. Like me. As we discussed in our consumer behavior lecture, psychographics is basically the science of using psychology and demographics to better understand consumers. In psychographic segmentation, though, buyers are divided into different groups on the basis of their psychological personality traits, lifestyles, or values. And people generally within the same demographic group can exhibit very different psychological profiles. 
One of the things that's interesting for me, I guess, uh, in the consumer behavior aspect, is completing what we call the VALS framework. It's a series of online uh, questions that you're going to answer. Uh, I think there's 35 of them, something like this. And it basically loads U.S. adults into about eight primary groups. And they look at the demographics and add attitudinal questions, things like this. And the VAL system is continuously being updated because about 80,000 people complete this survey every year. VALS is used to, has been evolved, if you will, to explain the relationship between psychology and consumer behavior. And the system uses proprietary psychometric techniques to measure concepts that researchers have proven that correlate with consumer behavior. So I have the, right down at the bottom here, I have the, um, web address. It's a little long, but if you'll just go to uh, strategicbusinessinsights.com, you can take the VAL survey. It takes you very little time, but it'll give you a little bit of indication about who you are, what you are, and what you're basically looking for. So again, this is one of the results that comes out uh, in the VAL segmentation. And this person was an innovator and thinker. And again, your primary type here is the innovator and secondary type is thinker. And as it shows, the primary type represents your dominant approach to life, while the secondary classification represents a particular emphasis that you give to your dominant approach. So again, it just gives you some good insight. And I would suggest if you haven't done it before, you go ahead and try out the VAL survey. Behavioral segmentation divides buyers into groups based on their knowledge of a product, attitude toward and use of a product, or just their general response to a product. Now, if we think about it, not everybody who buys a product has the same needs or wants, the same benefits from it that others do. Needs-based or benefit-based segmentation is widely used approach because it identifies distinct market segment segments with clear marketing implications. For example, think about the decision roles. You know, generally we play about five different roles in a buying decision. We can be the initiator, the influencer, the decider, the buyer, or the user. If you think about, for example, uh, your child, a uh, two, three year old has a tricycle, but they get older and all of a sudden you notice that it's a little bit too small and it's time for a bigger bike. Well, you may be the initiator, or in my case, the wife might've been the initiator telling us, telling me that our daughter needed a new bike. Um, the child may be the influencer. They may go to the store with you to help pick out which one they want. You may be the ultimate decider and buyer, but the child is going to be the user. So understanding all of these different roles is how we have to know which way are we going to shape a consumer's behavior. For example, if you think about children's breakfast cereal, why don't they advertise those to during sports shows or daytime television? Because they're gonna to advertise toward kids during kid shows because they know the kid's going to influence which cereal is going to be bought many times. So understanding all of these different aspects about behavior, about when people buy, how they buy, why they're buying, often plays a, a big role in what we're trying to accomplish. For example, think about the times that you go to the grocery store. We probably go to the grocery store for many different reasons. Oftentimes you could have just a pure stock up, which is when we fill the basket with everything we need for the next week or two weeks, bring it home, put it in the pantry, and we don't go back until we need to go stock up again. But then there's also those that, you know, we forgot something, we have to do a fill-in, we ran out of milk, there's special purpose. For example, you could be that you need to pick up um, a birthday cake, and that's the only reason you're going. Could be quick food, you want to get uh, something just for dinner that night, or quick non-food. Well, all of these different types of shopping trips that we take result in different behaviors, and also results in different types of shopping. For example, if you'll think about a grocery store, I'm sure you've seen it as well as it, I have, is that you walk in and there's generally the produce section right at the beginning. Then there may be the deli and bakery. On the back end of the wall is going to be the milk and another part is going to be the, the bread. And they want you to kind of move through the store so that you see everything that they have to offer in hopes that you buy something else. But in time, what they found is that because of our change in lifestyle and how busy we become as adults, is that we really don't want that hassle to have to run all over the store. So we've been making different stops. We've been stopping at the convenience store right by our house just for milk. Yeah, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's you know less hassle, so it's worth it. But one of the biggest threats that grocery stores started facing was from dollar stores. Dollar stores are actually um, 
and closer to most people's houses in many cases than is a grocery store because the grocery store is going to serve a larger geographic area than a dollar store will. So people were stopping at the dollar store. They were picking up milk and they were picking up bread and all of a sudden dollar store started adding more foods and they would, you know, were starting to take sales away from grocery stores. Well, some grocery, store, some grocery stores today have started putting milk and bread at the front of the store just because they want people to come in as knowing that it's going to be easy to get so they at least get that sale rather than you going to somebody else. One way to break the market down based on behavior is related to the evoke set that we talked about last week. And again, if we look at the target market, part of them are unaware of the, the product, part of them are aware. Of those that are aware, some have tried, some haven't. Those that have tried have rejected some, repeated others, and so forth down the, the line. And again, if you look, you know, you may become loyal to a brand, but you may be a light user or a heavy user. Different levels of behavior is going to alter how we're going to choose the types of products we want to buy. Segmenting business markets revolves around many of the same aspects as it does in the consumer market. For example, it could be demographics, the operating variables, the purchasing approach, situational factors, personal characteristics. All of these things can influence the different types of markets and their makeup. For example, a rubber tire company can sell tires to manufacturers of automobiles, trucks, farm tractors, forklifts, aircrafts, whatever. Okay. But within a chosen target industry, it can further segment by company size and set up a separate, separate operation for selling to large and smaller customers. Business marketers generally identify segments through a sequence process. Consider an aluminum company. The companies first undertook macro segmentation. It looked at which end user market to serve. Do we go automobile, residential, or beverage containers? It chooses the residential market, and then it needed to determine the most attractive product application. Do we build semi-finished material, building components, or aluminum mobile homes? There's a lot of choices. So again, they decided on focusing on building components. It then had to consider the best customer size and chose larger customers rather than small. The st second stage consisted of micro-segmentation. Here, the company distinguished among customer buying on price, service, or quality. Because it had a high service profile, the firm decided to concentrate on the service motivated segment of the market. So they made decisions based on all these different variables to get to what the market that they want to be able to achieve is going to deliver. We've talked about many different ways to segment markets, the many various bases that we've discussed, demographic, geographic, psychographic, etc. Well, one of the things that we must take into consideration is what's called the demographic, demographic trap, which is basically segmenting the marketing market in unmeaningful ways. If we look at this example, for example, let's say that we have a financial services market and we've come up with some demographic aspects we want to look at, income, education, age, amount of investment, frequency of transactions, and type of investment purchased. If we look at each of these categories and say each one of them has three different uh, variables, low income, mid income, high income, for example, that would give us a total of 729 segments. That's unmanageable. We have to pick the ones that make the most sense because, again, there's not going to be a lot of people that are going to be very high income at a very low age that have a very high level of education, such as a PhD. It makes very little sense. So make sure that we stay away from these traps. Just because we can segment it doesn't mean we should. Hello? I'd like to order french fries, a burger, and a milkshake. This is a library. I'd like to order french fries, a burger, and a milkshake. You know, it's interesting to see Mercedes take this type of humor, uh, given the fact that women purchase 60% of new cars. In the next lecture, we'll talk about finishing up the segmentation process.